Hi, I'm Tommy Brannan, Chairman of the Board of the Supervisors for Henrico County and Three Chop District Supervisor. Hi, and I'm Dan Schmidt. I'm the Brooklyn District Supervisor. I'm currently serving as the Vice Chairman of the 2020 Henrico Board of Supervisors. The reason we're coming to you today is to communicate. There's one thing that's been on everybody's mind, and that's COVID-19. And how do we communicate best to our community, to our businesses? So we are going to have several talks that we're going to tell you what your county is doing for you, how we're trying to protect you, what, what we're doing in every way to fight and, and help through this crisis. Dan? As the chairman mentioned, it's our goal to open up as many avenues of communication with our constituents as possible. This is just one mechanism. You'll hear others tonight on how you can follow and you can learn and you can and, and keep up with COVID-19 issues that are existing in our community. With COVID-19, uh, we have one of, one of our best uh, from our EOC, uh, Rob Rowley. Rob, would you tell everybody what your title is and, and what you do for Henrico County and then go into what we are doing for this fight against COVID-19? Yes, sir. Well, currently, uh, I'm serving as the Deputy Emergency Manager for the County of Henrico. Uh, and since March 3rd, I've uh, been working with a very talented team uh, in our Emergency Operations Center, or our EOC, uh, where I serve as the EOC Manager. Now, the EOC here in Henrico County has been open since March 3rd, uh, as you're aware. Uh, and to some folks, that may sound like we got started awfully early. Well, uh, there has been no secret uh, that COVID-19 is an extreme hazard, it's an extreme threat, uh, and the supervisors and the manager of Henrico recognized that we needed to get ahead of that problem. Uh, and so the EOC has been working since March 3rd uh, to develop our plans for how we're going to address uh, the needs of our residents in the face of COVID-19. Uh, COVID-19 represents an unusual problem, and we all know that, uh, but even for an EOC, uh, you know, EOCs, we're, we're all used to seeing the EOCs open up during a hurricane or a tornado. Uh, and, or even and, snow. Even snow, right? And, and, and uh, facilitating communications between uh, county agencies, communicating with the state, sometimes the federal government. And, and some of those communications look like reaching over to unimpacted areas uh, where we can obtain resources and people uh, to help manage a crisis. And that's, that's pretty routine for EOCs across the country. Uh, COVID-19 represents an, an especially difficult task uh, because there is no unaffected area for us to reach out to. Uh, there is nowhere in the country uh, that is not experiencing a shortage of resources. There is nowhere in the country uh, where there is not a staffing shortage or a shortage of personnel to manage the problem. And so this is really a crisis for which there is no good chapter to pull out of the playbook to address the problem. So frankly, uh, since March 3rd, we've been in the EOC writing that chapter. Okay, and Rob, also um, this board asked our EOC to do something a little bit different than we've asked in the past. Uh, on, on, would you tell everybody what we did uh, for regional because as we all know communication in anything is vital sure so would you review what we what we put forth uh, and just started on the fifth yeah yeah so, so we're very uh, proud of the fact quite frankly that Henrico kind of uh, spearheaded an effort to establish a regional incident command and what that looks like is uh, a partnership between the localities from across Metro Richmond uh, so folks including, but not limited to, the city of Richmond, uh, Henrico County, Chesterfield County, uh, Hanover County, and folks like that, uh, to get leadership from those jurisdictions together so that we could coordinate and collaborate uh, how our individual localities respond to COVID-19. All right, so, so what does that look like? Well, COVID-19 or, or really any kind of uh, a problem like this, one of the best things that we can do is educate our public about what they can do themselves to respond to the crisis. Uh, but what doesn't help is if people get conflicting or even just slightly different messages, right? In a time like this, even just slightly different messages uh, can call the credibility of a message into question. And so we wanted to make sure that when we consult with subject matter experts 
And when we talked to the folks who, who do public engagement, we wanted to make sure that they were all able to speak with one voice so that, quite frankly, if you are someone in Henrico County, but your mom lives in Chesterfield, you're hearing the same message, right? Because what is the best thing to do is the best thing to do regardless of where you live. You know, also, we recognized very early on that the logistical concerns related to COVID-19 uh, were gonna be at the forefront of the problem. So this includes uh, getting, getting personal protective equipment. I think, uh, I think now people who a few months ago had never heard of an N95 mask, you know, now an N95 mask is a household phrase. And so when we're trying to procure those items, uh, a lot of the, the traditional methods of going from locality, you know, uh, maximizing everything we have at the local level and then going to the state and then going to the federal level up to and including the strategic national stockpile, a lot of those channels are being really, really heavily burdened right now. And so we recognize there's an opportunity that wherever other channels of procuring equipment may exist, there's still value in the purchasing power of numbers. And so another task of that team at the regional level uh, has been to coordinate those purchases and see what we can do working together with the other jurisdictions uh, to leverage the purchasing power of quantity. Which is vital. Rob, you mentioned that our EOC stands up for weather-related incidents. The, the chairman mentioned that it even so opens up for a snow-related incident. And then you mentioned that um, from a regional cooperative standpoint, we're using it from purchasing power, we're using it from information gathering and certainly messaging. Mm -hmm. uh, one, of the, one of the ways I've, I've tried to explain this to constituents when they call and ask is that this particular incident that our EOC is open for um, is particularly challenging because there's no set timeline. So a snow incident, a, 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 a tornado, a weather incident has an incident and then has a recovery period. Um, we're well versed in that. Our emergency management system is, uh, is prepared for that. Um, this is something a little different. And, and, and so if you wouldn't mind, what does that mean for our residents and how they can expect information flow to come? Because from sure. a normal incident, you guys would manage the incident, then manage the recovery of it. For this one, you're managing both at the same time because the incident is ever evolving. Absolutely. Yeah, so anyone that tunes in to the usual informational sources, and when I say informational sources, uh, let me be clear, I mean authoritative informational sources, right? So the CDC, uh, the Virginia Health Department, uh, any, of, any of the usual channels that you communicate or get information from the county of Henrico, even the most authoritative sources uh, regarding COVID-19, they still present the information as, as estimates. Uh, if you see any of the graphs or any of the charts related to when is this going to peak, uh, when, is, when, is the, um, when is the spike in the number of patients going to happen, when is it going to peak, and then when is it going to decline, all of that information is still very much uh, presented as estimates. And so, you know, we're making the best good faith estimates that we can based on that information. But to your point, there's still no clear window or, or no clear date in mind about when this is going to end. Right. And, and again, I, I know I use the example of a hurricane quite often, but that's how we're used to thinking is that the hurricane happens. Six days later, we've got the roads cleared. Right. Nine days later, the power comes back on. Um, COVID-19, we don't have that. Well, Rob, let me let me ask you this. In, in using that model of a hurricane, mm -hmm. which most people are very aware of, hurricanes. I mean, we've all been dealing with them for years and years. And one of the things I've been trying to convey to the citizens of the Three Chop District that I've been talking to is this is like a hurricane. Being the eye of the storm hasn't gotten anywhere near Henrico County yet. Right. The only thing that we're seeing and feeling now are the outer bands of that hurricane, which in dealing with something like this, that concept, that visual, because we're all used to seeing the weather mm -hmm. channel and the big bands coming mm -hmm. through, we're just now, it, correct me if I'm wrong, we're just now seeing the outer bands right. of that hurricane. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, we also are obviously very sensitive uh, to the concerns of, of, of the residents, because uh, we, we understand that there's a lot of uh, protective measures that are being used for COVID-19, 
that we're just not used to dealing with in the past. And we understand that this is one of those where, where the cure for the disease has some complications of its own, and, and we understand that. Uh, and so, uh, as you mentioned a second ago, you know, we're not moving from that usual response into recovery thing. Response and recovery are happening at the same time. Uh, and now obviously, you know, some of the things that we're trying to deal with are implications um, from measures that are put in place that are well outside of the authority of Henrico County. So when the, when the state uh, issues mandates about how uh, our residents should behave, we understand that causes complexities uh, and we're trying to address those. Some of the best ways we can address that is with good information, is with education, making sure that folks understand why this, these various measures are being taken, uh, trying to offer them some ways to cope with these measures. Uh, and and there's, you know, there's, there's folks hard at work here at the county that uh, are doing things that I don't even understand, right? Trying to meet the needs of the citizens with everything from remote access to county services, um, doing some county services that would normally occur in person. They're now happening by, uh, happening virtually or by drop off. Sure. Uh, drop-off measures for folks that have dealings with the permit center, plans, things of that nature. Again, things that I'm not really sure how they operate daily, sure. but, I, but I do know this, uh, that those folks are working very hard and they're trying to adapt how the residents get access to the county right. despite um, the environment that we're operating in right now. We're going to talk about some of those ways they can access that in a minute. Um, I appreciate you bringing us up to speed on where we're at and what we've been doing. Um, our residents expect us as a county, as we always have, to be proactive for them. So not only are we serving their needs now as best we possibly can, but we're planning for the next step. And I understand you guys have put a lot of hard work into what's next for the county. So can you talk a little bit about uh, what could possibly be coming to help us out and help our residents and constituents out? Right, absolutely. So. Uh, myself, along with Jackson Banner, who's the emergency manager for the county, uh, we've had a lot of discussions about the what is next. And obviously, depending on which data source you look at, it's just it's different versions or different shades of, of not good. And so some of that is how do we support the residents, uh, but then also how do we support some of the, the critical services that are provided, maybe even not by the county, but services that are provided in the county. Uh, so we are, we're already having dialogue with uh, HCA and Mercy Bon Secours, the operators of, of, the hos of hospitals that you know, are in Henrico County. And VCU um, as well. VCU as well, actually, yes, sir, for, for, for some fantastic subject matter expertise. Uh, we're already having discussions with Dominion Power, right? And so these are, uh, the, for example, the hospitals and Dominion Power. These are places where we don't have a problem right now, but depending on how uh, COVID-19 progresses and depending on the impact that it has on, for example, the workforce at Dominion Power uh, or the capacity at some of our hospitals, mm -hmm. it has the potential to generate issues uh, that may spill beyond the walls uh, of those institutions. And, and quite frankly, uh, we're trying to get ahead of that. Um, it's, it's extremely proactive. In fact, some of the, uh, some of the dialogue uh, that we're having with these facilities um, is, is not even what would happen normally during a storm event or something like that. But we wanna make sure that we have these lines of communication established, we're building relationships, and we wanna make sure that when this thing gets really bad, um, that we have done everything that we can to prop these institutions up for success so that they can, frankly, keep ownership of any problem that, that is theirs. But if a problem could possibly spill outside of that institution and have an impact on the county, mm -hmm. we want to know about it ahead of time and we want to do what we can to prevent that. There's, uh, we just took a, a huge leap this week to not only educate hospitals which are our, our front line with medical um, our first responders here in Henrico County uh, and and other jurisdictions uh, and and also other parts of the medical field and also our county employees that are on the front line our mental health our social services uh, these people will we because the Henrico County can't close we have to operate and 
we are putting our employees on the front lines. So do you want to review real quick the program that we have just gotten started that will address not only keeping our front line safe for our citizens, but the region's front line safe. Would you, sure. would you comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, first I would say that we are extremely proud of this uh, because unless something has changed that we don't know about, uh, we will be the first ones in the state uh, to offer this level of testing. Uh, and I would give uh, all the credit to this again to our emergency manager, Jackson Banner, who's really spearheaded this effort uh, and entered into a good partnership uh, with Dent Trust Dental of Virginia. Uh, and we're hoping, excuse me, we have every reason to think that we are going to start testing at the end of next week. And uh, I'll reference my, uh, my cheat sheet here because uh, there's some technical stuff here, but it's a two-part testing. Um, the, the testing that's being done for COVID-19 in the state right now, it's, it's good stuff. Sometimes when it's all you can get, you have to make do, right? Um, but this is kind of the next level of that testing. It's a two-part testing. Uh, the first test is an IgM and an IgG uh, duo antibody test. Uh, and the second test is a COVID-19 AG antigen test. Now, what, what really matters out of this is that with these two tests combined, we can get a much more uh, thorough look at the progression of the virus through the entirety of, uh, of the disease process, right? From, from very early infection, uh, possibly even folks who are infected but not yet symptomatic, all the way through folks who may have remained asymptomatic or without symptoms the entire time, and they have now completely uh, recovered from the virus, but the, but the body has left markers behind, those antibodies, the markers are left behind that lets us know that the person had COVID-19 but has now recovered. Now, uh, let me start by, I am not an epidemiologist, but from talking to the folks who are, uh, the reason that this is so such a big deal is it's providing, or these tests will provide a lot of the data that we don't have right now that is causing us to have very incomplete pictures when we talk about uh, when we talk about the disease spread. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that it's all over the news. Everywhere you look, people are talking about asymptomatic spread or talking about people that have, have had the virus and recovered and how they could fit into the workforce or stuff like that. The problem is there's no way to capture all of that data right now to make those, to make those decisions. All of the data that we're missing, these two tests uh, combined, will give us that data. Uh, and and it, so it'll allow us to make much better because much more well-informed decisions. And, and again, some of the uh, potential areas that, that we're looking at this paying off is when we talk with the health, the health experts about the use of folks who have had COVID-19 and have recovered from it, mm -hmm. being able to uh, plug back into the workforce. Again, all of the numbers that we're missing right now from, from the folks who are asymptomatic. Uh, and so we're, we're really proud of the fact uh, that this this initiative to get this testing was born and, and quite frankly, uh, driven by Henrico. Uh, but we also understand that COVID-19 uh, doesn't respect the county line. And so we have been working closely with a lot of our neighbors who are looking to enter into this agreement with us uh, to offer this service to first responders outside of the county of Henrico. And then uh, as, as you mentioned, when you first started talking about this, uh, also the healthcare facilities, right? Because, you know, we can, we can provide the best uh, pre-hospital care that we can. We still need hospitals to take these patients to. And so being able to offer this testing to the workforce right. at our area hospitals is also huge. Two highlights of, the, of it, uh, Rob, real quick. This, this new type of testing was, was approved and released how long ago? It is... Uh, it is approved. This is, uh, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, frankly, because of our initiatives, it has been approved for experimental use. Uh, is is the, the actual stamp the FDA, the FDA puts on it. Right. And what is the turnaround on when someone gets a test done? Yeah, excellent question. And so that's another one of the really nice parts of this test is we're looking at a 30-minute a turnaround. 
so the tests will actually be rolled out uh, in a drive-through fashion. Uh, people will get, uh, will get 30 minute results. Uh, and then once those results uh, are delivered back to that person, what that may or may not mean for their return to work or their stay at work uh, will then be up to uh, their home jurisdiction. So, mm -hmm. so in Henrico, uh, if, if someone gets a positive test, uh, then that'll be a follow-up with employee health services. And we have some, some mechanisms there to make decisions about return to work. Uh, same thing will happen with other jurisdictions who decide to go into the initiative with us. Um, if someone gets a positive result, it'll then be up to their agency uh, how that return to work policy is executed. A couple exciting things about that is good data allows you to make good decisions. Yes. Certainly looking forward to that good data. Um, the speed of the test and the ability to keep the people that are serving our residents safe. Um, we can't be of service to our constituents if our first responders and our health professionals are not safe. So yeah. I'm excited to see that progress, and I, I applaud your work and the county's effort to put that to put that through. As we close out, a couple quick questions with for residents. Really, what can what can our what can our constituents, what can our residents do to help? One, briefly, uh, with regard to calling for service via the 911 system, and then two, following uh, following us on Twitter and our Facebook pages and our and our messaging system. So, can you help our residents know what can they do to help support the effort? Sure, sure. And, and I know that the the fire chief Alec Auten, um has touched on the subject already through uh, through various venues, but we can't emphasize enough. Um, this is, it's going to unfortunately get worse uh, in the days and weeks to come. Uh, and all, frankly, all of our county resources are going to be taxed, uh, and especially our public safety resources, uh, and not just fire and EMS, but also our, our partners in law enforcement. And so we really ask folks to um, just use good judgment uh, now more than ever with utilization of 911 resources. Uh, and so we don't expect folks. Uh, to be medical professionals, to know exactly uh, if they have a certain condition that meets some kind of criteria, but just basic good judgment uh, about whether or not you think something is a life threat uh, before trying to draw on the 911 resources. Uh, as far as information, again, this is uh, one of the benefits of leveraging that regional cooperative. Uh, there's lots of messaging that is going out. Uh, and and I, I want to assure folks that the information that's coming out from these good, official, trustworthy sources, <laughs> the CDC, the VDH, and any of your Henrico uh, resources, mm -hmm. it's timely information. Uh, so don't feel the need to go looking for unofficial information from some unvetted source. Stick, stick with your trusted sources of information. We have mechanisms and we have personnel that are making sure that we're getting good, reliable, timely information out. Uh, so please rely on that first. We'll be able to put up the uh, website on the screen here and we'll also put up the uh, hotline number that, for public health that our folks can call. There's also a texting option. So uh, we'll make sure we show that on the screen with the public hotline, health hotline, the texting option, and then the Henrico, uh, Henrico website with henrico.us backslash news. Thanks, yes, Rob. Sir. Yes, sir. Rob, thank you. And, and just winding it up, Dan, we need to review again the protocols that everybody uh, is saying and to, to stop the spread, they're important. Wash your hands. Mm -hmm. Keep safe distance between you and others. And uh, uh, as, as much as possible, stay at home, uh, enjoy the time with your family, enjoy the time with, with uh, talking on the phone with your friends, but the, the distance is and will make a difference as we go forth. Uh, thank you for, for watching us, and we will be back uh, with, with some other information uh, as the days go on. Thank you. Thank you.